I'm Clinton. And welcome to Black Atlantic. We are a primarily Black Atlantic-centric podcast, website, and media channel with the goal of bringing POC Atlantic voices to the world. You can expect to hear from us every week with guests or open discussions exploring topics from all over East Coast Canada and East Coast Canada. I meant to say all over Atlantic Canada. <laughs> I was like, you Canada, Canada and East Coast Canada. East Coast. Canada. I know, I know. It's because we have an Ontario man's here today, so. <laughs> That's fair. Well, I usually say Atlantic Canada and East Coast. Um, My uh, bad. Should... Okay, go on. No worries. If you're listening to this, be sure to visit our website at blackatlantic.ca. You can also find us anywhere on, on social media at Black Atlantic and wherever you get your podcasts. And this week, we were speaking with Neil Logic Donaldson, the founder of Stolen from Africa and so many other endeavors and programs and things. You will hear the the laundry list. He's as busy as I am, and I didn't know if that was possible, but this man is doing so much. Um, but to start, Clinton, how are you this week? I'm good. The whole family, it was our, our turn this week so, or last week. So we're just uh, recovering from coronavirus. All four of us that are living in this house, it was... Uh, it was a week of rest for sure, which I needed. Uh, and yeah, we're all pretty much better, but that's been mostly my week hanging out I, with the fam at home. I will say that in the last episode, since we were together, you did mention the going to Costco unmasked. And so. Yeah. Yeah. Womp womp. <laughs> I don't think I got it from Costco. I, think I, I don't got think you got it from school. Costco. <laughs> no, no. What happened was I had my mask, but my kid forgot his. So I gave him mine and I went in there, you know, I went in there no mask but that same evening when we got home my kid was already starting to run a fever so i don't think i picked it up from costco i think i got it from him like our kids entire school has it right now so oh to new brunswick where yeah. yeah um i wanted to use my my how am i this week to talk about some work that i'm doing with prude um an organization out of saint john that we've discussed our friends with have partnered with before you spoke uh clinton at one of their panels and discussions before I don't even know all of the amazing things that they're doing for minority groups and other different groups out of St. John. But what I do know is I was asked to um, help them with this project called Real Women. And the the endeavor is very similar to what our good friend Manju Varma, the commissioner of systemic racism is doing, where they're trying to basically survey the women of St. John, Rosse, and that area, um, and get their feedback on what it's like to be a woman in New Brunswick, their barriers of health, how they feel about the police, have they experienced domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can make recommendations to their municipal and provincial governments. Um, I've been encouraged to share it with Moncton women, um, really anyone who identifies as a female in New Brunswick, I think it would be very helpful, though they are trying to target the St. John municipality because they're already connected with those officials. But if you are listening to this and you have time, go to uh, go to prudeinc.org and just you can either fill out a survey, do a live interview. But if you are female identifying, just speak to your experience as a New Brunswick woman. And it's really going to help hopefully shift um, a lot of the narrative that women are experiencing in New Brunswick. That's amazing. That sounds really important. Yeah, I'm very, very excited as someone who has, you know, been been through it as a woman in New Brunswick. I'm really excited to hopefully encourage some more change, but enough about me. As I said, this week we are meeting with Neil Logic Donaldson, who I'm so excited to have on the show. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because you have so much, so much that you're doing, but I will say that we're connected through a friend of Megan. Um, We know some similar business partners. We have a lot of the same, I think, goals with our two businesses, Black Atlantic, and all of the different businesses that you have. Um, I think we align really well in our messaging and endeavors. And I was so excited to meet you when I did. And you do so many cool things in the Toronto community that I hope people listening from New Brunswick or anywhere around the world will be inspired by your story, inspired by what you're doing for the community, and will either follow along and pay attention to everything you're doing or try to do the same thing in their communities. Because the way you engage Toronto and all of the amazing things you're doing is I'm, I'm inspired by it every time I see your social media every day, because you're doing such cool stuff. So (laughs) tell all our listeners about you. Oh man, that's always a challenge. It's like, talk about me. Like I, I, I'm just like a doer, you know, um, well, I guess, you know, yeah, Logic, um, that, that's my, my you know, artist name, uh, hip hop name, founder of Stolen from Africa. Um, Stolen from Africa is a Black arts education organization here in Toronto. 
Um, been around since like, you know, 2004, really just started off as like a t-shirt campaign as a way to kind of like highlight and instigate conversations about, um, you know, systemic oppression. Um, in 2010, we um, you know, registered as a, as a nonprofit organization and really took our, you know, mission really serious and really started doing stuff in, in schools, working primarily with young people, just to find ways to, you know, um, I guess like, foster education and build up self-esteem and you know really just to um change like the the narrative of like the school curriculum um we find that you know um you know especially in toronto it's like you know really diverse as they say um but the school curriculum doesn't really represent that you know um diversity so um so we started doing that um i don't know like what else man like you know i'm a father i got two beautiful girls i got like a, a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old to keep me on my toes um someone i'm just passionate about community um hip-hop is like the foundation to like everything that i do and as you know like you know like hip-hop is is like the movement right now you know it connects people so everything i do is about like connection it's about um people discovering themselves discovering each other and you know how we can you know just offer something positive so yeah that's amazing um why don't you tell us about like what it was like for you, for our listeners growing up in Toronto with hip hop and the Canadian experience uh, and what that whole experience was like for you? Yeah, I mean, well, OK, like growing up in Toronto, like right at the top, like um, the diversity, I think, is something that stands out. Um, you know, when 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 I was younger, I was in like French immersion. And so I have a little splash of French, you know, like, you know, it's somewhere somewhere in there, my my subconscious and whatnot. But um, <laughs> just growing up, like, you know, being around diverse, you know, peoples, um, I think, like, opened up my, like, views to things, because, you know, my friends were, like, the United Nations, so I'd be going to, you know, houses that were, like, you know, Persian, or, um, you know, from, like, you know, Korean, or, you know, um, Indian, or, and various parts of, like, the Caribbean and whatnot, so um, I, I think, like, that really um, opened up my eyes to, like, like the cultures of, of the world, and, um, and just, you know, just, for, you know, minimizing like ignorance and just the way how I like interact with, with people, you know, so I'm um, always had like an open mind. So like, you know, I'll, I'll start with there um, in terms of like, like hip hop culture, like hip hop is, you know, where I like found like my voice, um, you know, the, the hip hop scene in Toronto was really what um, just got me like just activated and wanted to, um, you know, just do something, you know, like when, when I came up in the, in the nineties, um, you know, there's a lot of like positive, like energy and, you know, hip hop again was a way for us to like, just really have our voice. So I got into really early and just, um, yeah, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to find like the, the, the right words to, to like explain it. Um, yeah, like the best way I can explain it is just, it just really facilitated like my like identity, you know, I wasn't getting that like in, in schools and whatnot. And, and hip hop was just where I found like all my purpose, you know, everything that I do is like rooted in that. And, you know, it, it was a scene of, of like support, you know, I mean, back in the day, you know, Toronto was labeled as like the screw face capital, but at the same time, like, you know, um, I, I think that, you know, there was a lot of like support in, you know, in a, in a strange way, you know, um, I don't know what else to say really. I uh, hope that answers the question. <laughs> there was a support likely in being like in a city of millions and millions of people, still yeah. a community, a community where if you grew up with a diverse point of view and um, around all cultures, where you could be a part of that community and you know the spots to go to and the places that's where it. you're yeah. going to be seeing the same people out at events. And maybe yeah. that's what you mean. It just fostered this sense of belonging and community in such a big, that that's exactly it. And I think that's something that I, I take yeah. I take for granted because it's like so like regular to me until like you know you leave outside of Toronto and you realize oh shoot like Canada isn't as diverse as we project to the world. It's really just Toronto and maybe Montreal or something. But um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's what really fostered community is that we're able to to keep our our cultural identities because a lot of us are like you know first generation Canadian. You know my family's Jamaican and whatnot, and and so we're all, all my other friends. But we were able to like represent who we were and and we all celebrated that so i think like that's yeah you're right you know it definitely foster that type of community amazing i wanted to ask so because you mentioned in, in your your brief introduction about stolen from africa and the amazing work that you're doing yeah. how that you're really trying to target the youth because like fostering that sense of community there and even in discussing you know how 
hip hop helped you find like that, that purpose and that identity. I'm curious because Clinton and I have been working as much as we can, you know, with, with the different school boards to try to foster better black histories. And obviously you and your, you've, you've done that in your own way by building this nonprofit going there. You also do the Sankofa school tours, which we'll talk about a bit later. And you do all of these things to engage the community without like being like, Hey, school boards, like you guys have to revamp the entire school board. I'm just wondering what was school like for you? Like, did you really, because it's such a diverse place, did you ever feel like lost as a black person or not represented to like, to create something like Stolen from Africa where you felt that it was needed? Did you find that black histories were just also not spoken about despite the diversity in the classrooms? What was that like? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You know, um, it, it, it's, it's funny, like I, I came to like this recent um, revelation that a lot of the things that I've created or the things that I've, um, you know, indulged myself in, it, it's really, you know, like a, a coping mechanism of, of dealing with like trauma, you know, like, so even, even like when it comes to like Stone from Africa or me, my involvement in hip hop, like finding a voice, it's, and, and, you know, building Stone from Africa, it was a response out of like the lack, you know, so um, yeah, like the education system in my ex experience um, didn't really have representations of people who looked like me, you know, like I, I didn't know about, you know, um, like the like the, the general black experience that that we had um, history outside of like slavery, you know, that was always like the narrative and, and that that's it. Um, you know, so when when you're not like represented in, in the school curriculum, like naturally you're not going to be invested you know, in education. So this idea of, of like education not being empowering was like my entire high school experience. Um, so, and, and a lot of my, my friends, you know, experienced that um, to the point what, what happened was is like, you know, I ended up dropping out of school and, you know, starting music, like really like full-time, that was my thing. But then I was, you know, really blessed with the opportunity to um, attend the University of Toronto through a bridging program called the Transitional Year Program. And through that, I was I was able to like learn more about my my history and and just like the truth, you know, and really understanding like the impacts of colonialism, imperialism, and just you know like why you know how how things operate like on a systemic level, and and you know then at that moment I really just got frustrated because I was like all this information is something that we were looking for in high school, but it was hidden. And a lot of my peers, you know, ended up dropping out. Like we just didn't graduate and we left. So we missed this whole like education gap. But then in the university level, it's like, okay, here you go. You get everything. And now we'll tell you the truth, <laughs> you know? And, and so, you know, I took all that, that knowledge and then that became like my, my fuel. And, and, you know, um, and that just became like the empowerment. So all the knowledge I was getting, like learning about Africville and, and just like other, like, you know, um, black histories that are just phenomenal. Um, that was a way of just like building up like self-esteem and, and empowerment and just like kind of like repackaging this like idea of like what education can, can mean. You know, in Toronto, we talk about being inclusive and being multicultural. Um, this was like an opportunity to like really like facilitate that, so. That's really important that you say that because in my past two years of podcasting out here in New Brunswick, I hear a lot of New Brunswickers talk about the lack of education they received regarding um, Black history or Black people or other cultures and stuff like that. And, and everyone's so baffled. Oh, it was so bad out here in New Brunswick. They didn't teach us this. They didn't teach us that. Uh, you hear the same things in Nova Scotia. And people out here assume that it was different for other kids in other provinces or even big cities. People as maybe assume that just because Toronto is a diverse multicultural yeah. city that they were these kids us we were somehow getting a better education in school when we learned about history and social studies and the global world and stuff like that global world issues uh, and and we didn't we didn't get any better education to be honest this was the same education um another reason why your your organization are, is so important and the fact that you went out there and learned it on your own is so important but uh yeah we didn't get that education in toronto either regardless of how diverse it was um well, let's talk about the East Coast. Let's talk about Nova yeah. Scotia and let's talk about Africa. Oh, um, you once we got to we got to tie you to the East Coast here. Of course, um, man. Oh boy, Africa. Yeah, what a story. Uh, you once did a documentary on Africa. Um, can you tell us why you did the documentary? Uh, why yeah. Africa? And what was the impact oh, of this work? Man, man it, it like gets me emotional just thinking about it. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so at the time when we were filming the Africville documentary, this is going back to like 2007. So 2006 was when I first heard about um, Africville. And it was in an interesting time when we were just kind of, you know, we're like, you know, about two years deep into like Stolen from Africa, like, you know, getting a nice little buzz around the hip hop community and scene and, and just making all this noise, you know, about our history and colonization and whatnot. Like we were just like with this fresh knowledge and we just, you know, had the megaphone and, and whatnot. But it was at a time where people weren't really um, ready to receive, you know, this type of like knowledge and whatnot. Like, you no know, conversations were typically like, yo, like, why are you guys talking about like slavery and being stolen and all this stuff? Like that happened such a long time ago. We progressed way past that. And, and, you know, you guys are ruffling the feathers and, and causing like drama. And to the point where it was just like, like tension was so high and, and people would always say like, yo, like slavery, that's not even a Canadian thing. That's like an American thing. Like, what are you guys really doing? You know? And, and, you know, I remember at that moment getting kind of like insecure because like, I, I felt that this is such like an important like cause and, and the things that we're discovering and how it's making me feel. Um, you know, I, at that time I got connected with um, a brother named, um, named Gary or Papa Grant. He's actually lives in Toronto now, but at the time he was from like North Preston. And, um, you know, a friend of mine, like, you know, connected me with him. He was like, yo, like, you got to connect with this guy, man. Like, you know, about out, out in the East coast, I'm like the East coast. So like, yeah, I kind of heard about Scotians, you know, but didn't really know much. So got in a conversation with him and we we, well, we spoke for maybe like three hours on the phone and he just gave me the rundown about Africaville and North Preston and, you know, being like sixth generation Canadian and just going off like on this stuff. And I was just like, this is crazy, man. I got to go out there, you know? So I, I I had like a little bit of money from my OSAP, <laughs> you know me while I was at, at, at U of T and I was like, you know, um, I was like, yo, let me, let me, let me book a, a, a flight um or, or my trip around this like hip-hop boat cruise that was happening like um in July um and so I, I booked everything stayed at Dalhousie University came to this like you know um boat cruise like solo dolo by myself and you know I was just like yo like what up man I'm from Toronto and I'm just trying to learn what's going on and everybody just kind of like showed love and just like took me under the wings and really gave me the rundown about Nova Scotia, brought me around to the grounds where Africville was. Yo, shout out Ghetto Child, man. Shout out uh, Jordan. Shout out uh, DJ um, DJ Ivy, um, RS Smooth. You know what I'm saying? Like like all these guys, man, they just took me under their wings. And and I think they're probably just tripped out, man. It's like, yo, who's this guy like, just out here? Like, you know what I mean? But it was so important to me. Like I was on a mission. I was like, nah, yo, I got to come out here. So that was like the spark, you know, to, to the flame. And then when I came back to Toronto, I was like back with a vengeance, man. I was like, yo, y'all should have never told me about Africville. You know what I mean? Because now, now I had like, you know, like I had my case in point now. You know, I had all the information that I needed. And then the connection with slavery and all these things. It's like, yo, that actually did happen here. So um, so with that information, um, we, myself and a few others, like, you know, we, we presented at this... Um, it was, I think they called it like like a like a funder like speed dating type of event or whatever. So anyway, so we were there like and we were, we presented about like Africaville and this new foundings. And there is um a woman by the name of um Marie, man. She's actually a good friend of mine now. Um, she was um the ED at Canadian Heritage at the time, and just saw our passion and our drive and what we're doing. And she was like, yo, let's set up a meeting and see what we can do. And I was like, yo, I want to do a documentary that's centered around like the Africaville like you know annual picnic that happens in July. And she was like, okay cool, let's do it. Just like that, you know, just gave us funds and we made it happen. Like we didn't have to really, I mean, we end up writing the contract later, but we didn't have to write no proposal or anything. It was just like a done deal. And so we go out to Nova Scotia um, and, you know, centered around like the, um, you know, the Africville picnic and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're hanging around like actual, you know, people who, who lived in Africville, like, you know, the descendants are still alive, you know, and their, their children and the experiences and being around in the campgrounds and just going around tent to tent and just hearing stories. Um, it was just such like an incredible emotional vibe. Like it, it, it's like the first time I actually felt Canadian, you know what I mean? Like, like black Canadian was, it, it gave me like an identity, you know, like people talk about like Mecca and, you know, doing all that kind of pilgrims, like going to Nova Scotia, the Africaville um, annual picnic was like, that was like our like Canadian, like Mecca. And it just gave me that sense of a pride and identity. And I actually found like a sense of belonging, you know what I'm saying? Like being born and raised in Toronto to like Jamaican parents, you know, I never felt Canadian. It's always like hyphenated. I felt more Jamaican than Canadian, you know what I'm saying? But um, 
going to Africaville and connecting with people, like I came back with a vengeance. So I was like, yo, and, you know, going to the schools and then teachers alike, principals were just like shocked of like, what is this history? Like, what, what, what is this? We never knew about it. I'm like, well, this is why, you know, we, we need more diverse curriculum. And that just kind of gave us an in, you know what I mean? So it was just like a real, like powerful, very empowering, um, you know, like moment in time that I'll like always like cherish because it just, um, it really just like contextualized like a lot of things. And then it just made me think about, okay, well, what else are they hiding? You know, Africa is just one story. What else is there? And there's a lot yep. more. So, Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I feel like I almost feel jealous in a way <laughs> because I've never, I like I've, I've been struggling with being black Canadian for so long. Yeah. I don't know that I've had that Mecca feeling, but that's such a, an emotional and moving story. And it's also something as well, that being East, East Coast, I only learned about this a year or two years ago and only through knowing wow. prolific writer, George Eliot Clark. Like they're not teaching that in New Brunswick schools either. Yeah. And we're one province old, away. Yeah, shout out George Eliot Clark, man. That's the big <laughs> George <character>. Eliot Clark. <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> love, love that man. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, only through speaking with him and talking about how much erasure and how erasure is Canada's oh. form of racism. That's the, that's the whole, that's our whole shtick, unfortunately. Yeah. And only in that conversation did I learn anything about right. what was going on in Nova Scotia. It's like New Brunswick's like, we're our own contained little bubble. Racism has never happened here. We have Acadians and everything is perfect. And I'm like, no, it isn't. Interesting. It's Interesting. not. Yeah. Um, I wanted to launch into, I feel like perfect snowball effect into all of the things that you are doing. And I've tried to find the list. <laughs> so let's see, you've got, you did coping during COVID. You've got a parenthood relationship and self-care five week program called reason with logic that you did. You've got the Sankofa school tour. You've got your Instagram lives, how you doing fam, which I've been on. You've got yeah. your other two podcasts that you do yeah. three other podcasts uh, yeah yeah the, the uh Reminis show which is more yes. like the pop foundation um mm -hmm. and then and then there's um St. Kofa's space which is like on on Twitter that's more like web3 NFT type conversation yes. yeah yeah so you're I thank you for finding the time to speak <laughs> with us because sure. I know your time is limited yeah. um but I'm just I, I mean I feel like you probably already answered this question but you're, there's so much you have going on. What is your your big motivation behind all of that work? What would you say has been your greatest success out of all of that work? And then how have you, like, I mean, I know why it's fulfilling because we do something similar, but in your own words, why do you find all of this stuff so, such, so fulfilling? Um, okay, so I, I think like what like drives me um, kind of, you know, goes back to what I mentioned before is just the revelation of, you know, the things I'm doing is it's like this coping mechanism to like work through like the, the trauma that I've, I've experienced, you know, of not having a voice, um, feeling excluded, feeling isolated, just like being Canadian, but not really, um, you know, so I think like that's like my, my, my motivation to um, create space for, for others, you know, like I think there's a value in, in sharing stories and, and we all have something important to, um, to bring to the table. So, um, so I really get like a lot of joy in just like facilitating conversations. Um, so, so there's that, um, in terms of like success, um, I, I think like the success would be, okay, well, there, I, I think there's a few, like, well, first that comes to mind is to be able to like do like workshops and stuff like in schools and, and have like every generation of young people, like since like the, the, the mid two thousands up until now still resonate with like the stolen from Africa message. You know, I think like that's like something that's really exciting to me. There's so many like brands and ideas and organizations that come and go, but for some reason we've been able to like still be like relevant um, for for every generation. And there's times where I'm like, will, will young people even think this is like interesting anymore? Like, do people even care about history? And like the answer is yes, like every single time. And not just black youth, like all youth, right? Because even even white youth has been lied to. You know what I mean? Like these, you come to me and it's like, man, they lied to us too. And I'm like, yeah, straight up, <laughs> you know? So everybody wants like the truth right now. That's all what it is. So to have like young people on board, to have um, like school staff on board is like a big thing now. Like when I go into schools and, and they call me logic and they're, you know, cutting checks for stolen from Africa and, 
And like, just like, it, it's not like a, a thing that I have to explain anymore. Like I come into the school looking like this. I don't, I don't have to like put on a suit. I, I like to wear suits every now and then look at it wrong, but you know, I, I don't, I don't have to play the game. You know what I'm saying? Like I can really just show up as my authentic self, however I feel. And that scene as professional. Um, that's a really big success for me. Um, I think just success, just to be able to do what I love, like full time, like, you know, this is like, I'm really living my passion. And, um, and what was the last question again? What was the, <laughs> How have you found it all to be like all of the networking, everything you do, like how, how have you found it so fulfilling? But I, you sort of answer that in like the drive and the ambition. Well, I, 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 it's healing. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's really what it boils down to. Like, you know, start off with the purpose as this coping mechanism, but not just coping it, it. It's healing because I know that a lot of people feel the way that I do, you know, um, and, and just building like this, like larger, like community and, and this larger, like, like family and, um, and you know, just, yeah, like that, that's what just gets me like, you know, in, inspired. So it's like, it's, it's pretty, you know, I feel really humbled and fortunate that, you know, um, you know, created like an idea and, you know, people buy into it and they want to support it and contribute to it and, and find it like meaningful. And, you know, so it's, um yeah, it's powerful. That's really, uh, it's amazing what uh, people can accomplish when they feel like their voices aren't being heard. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing what a, a force that can be in the universe. And it's also really cool to hear, uh, you know, it is a great feeling to be able to show up to do what you do for your daily living and feel like you're being your authentic self as All you go day. through your life every day. Yes. So many people work to have money just to try to do what they want to do when they're not working but when you can in really be yourself at work that's yeah those are those in are great answers that, man. So, um, yeah shout out to everyone on, on the grind man like i know what it is yep. you got to do what you got to do but you know still have that passion like you know find ways you know like what kept, what has kept me going when i was in that those positions is just yo know, slow motion is better than no motion so no doubt. just you know don't think about the larger things just just stick to it piece by piece brick by brick you know what I mean? Keep cultivating it, keep nurturing it, keep giving it energy and it'll go where it goes. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you got to do what you have to do, right? So. Yeah, that's a great segue into our next question. And that is, uh, you know, you alluded to, you've been doing this for generations, generation to generation about the truth and the future. Uh, so what's next for you and your organizations? Or what's now? What's now and what's next? Um, Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, I think, okay, well, I think what's next really um, is things have evolved to a place where now a lot of my, my youth participants over the years have now grown and matured. And now they're kind of like co-facilitating, co you know, um, workshops and things of the nature with me as well. So I think what the future looks like wow. or what the next thing is, is, you know, a new generation of, you know, stolen from Africa youth. Like, I don't know what to call them, but, you know, a little army um, coming up where, you know, I can just kind of like sit back a little bit, you know, I know I'll always be around because it's just my nature and I'll probably be doing even more things, um, maybe more international work. Um, but yeah, like I, I think like that's really what it is, like just um, training young people for them to be empowered so that they can be facilitators themselves and discover their talents and then create their own, you know, endeavors. Um, I think like that's like a really big for me, the thing for me. Um, 2024 will be 20 years of stolen from Africa. It's kind of crazy to say that out loud, you know, like since like the first like t-shirt was printed. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking to like, you know, maybe put together, not maybe, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put this out, out in the, the atmosphere, man, to like have like a, a documentary that really kind of highlights the years of stuff. Cause I got a lot of content, you know, some, a lot of yeah. memorable moments and, you know, really just to kind of like highlight and capture you know, and hopefully deliver or offer something to the community that's really inspiring. So, so, you know, the new generation is coming up with ideas because there's always things that we need to solve. You know, there's always going to be problems, <laughs> you know, so, um, and, and we, we can't, I can't do everything on my own. So um, anything that would just inspire someone to be like, you know what, like, okay, no idea is too small. Like I, I can really do something and I just have to stick with it. You know, I think that's probably one of the most like, you know, important things. Um, and I'll say that's next is really just sticking on a message and being consistent, you know? Um, but um, yeah, I think like that. Passing something on. I think that's the true yeah. sign of having mm -hmm. built something. Yeah. 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 You have the ability to pass it on and have it stay standing. 
Yeah, and and that that's how how you you know I, I watch I'm, I watch a lot of documentaries. You know what I mean? And and I watch like how like you know different brands or organizations like rise and fall. And a lot of it is because they they don't know when to to let to let it let it go and or to to bring in like some new energy and whatnot. They always want to control it and and hold and be like, no, this is mine. And and no, it's it's the communities. You know, first and foremost. You know, like I'm I'm just kind of like the the, the gardener, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like this is the garden and the flowers are growing. Like, you know, I just, you know, come do my thing. And, and you know, we, we have to, that, that's how we keep like the energy rotating. You know, I don't want to be a gatekeeper. You know, that's something that I've seen over, over time. And, and it becomes like, you know, stagnant and, you know, this is something that has to grow and, and flourish. So um, we need the new energy um, and we just got to do it right. So. Yeah, we, I think we definitely agree with that, that statement. Yeah. And I, yeah, I wholeheartedly believe that. I also think you speak to not only um, how you can use, and we've talked about this before on the show with other people yeah. too, using your your trauma to create yeah. something that is long lasting. But um, I want to highlight that today for you, the day that we're recording is your yeah. one year anniversary yeah, of being yeah. weed free. Yes. Um, yeah. And I think that that yeah. vulnerability is what makes it so real. Like you... Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I won't say you have to, but there, yeah. there's something so compelling about all of us in this yeah. space who we're, we're black people who are honest about our various struggles, how we've coped with all yeah. that. And it compels you to care because you're honest and vulnerable in such a way that it is uplifting. And that's how you get into all of these organizations and all, all of this movement yeah. that you've done because you keep it real hundred percent all of the time. Yeah. Um, and congratulations on that Thank one you. year. I, yeah, I know no. the struggle for different substances for different purposes for, sure, for different reasons. For sure. um, but yeah, big congrats. Yeah, no, no, like, thank you for that. And, you know, I, it was one of those things where I was like, am I going to post this or not? Like, I was debating, like, whether I, I wrote the whole thing and I was like, I don't even know if I even want to put myself up. But I was like, no, you know what? Like, I think that's, you know, that just, yeah, like you said, like being vulnerable and just being authentic. I think like, that's just the way, way to do it. Like, I, I don't ever want to come across as like, being like perfect or like squeaky clean. Like I said, I watch a lot of documentaries and like a lot of people like fall like that, you know what I mean? Cause they create this like persona of just like perfection and and whatnot. And it's like, no, I mean, you, you got some cracks, you know what I mean? And, and you know, and I, I believe in, you know I, I rather show my own cracks than, than someone else to, to, to say it for me, you know what I mean? Because no one can tell my story better than me. And, and also just to show that, that, that it's real, like, you know what I mean? Like, like smoking weed, man, I started that when I was like 14 and and again, that was, you know, coping mechanism, you know, part of, part of it's also culturally to, you know, Jamaica, hip hop, whatever, whatever. And it, it served its purpose, you know, like when, when, when I started, but then, you know, it becomes like habitual and then, you know, the habits become like toxic and they may interfere with certain things. And then, and then, you know, you just, it just, you know, just doesn't do what it, what it's supposed to do. You know, I'm still like an advocate for, you know, for, for cannabis, but um, I, I think that, you know, it's not for, for everybody. And, and, and also do there, there's healthier ways of, of consumption. You don't have to like smoke, you know what I mean? There's so many different ways. It's a wonderful plant. Um, I've grown, grown a couple of plants myself, you know what I mean? But um, <laughs> it's um, yeah, like it was, it was really like important for me to just like, kind of like put that out there um, because you know, there's a lot of people who are like struggling with things and, and we just need to see like examples of hope. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's really like what my bottom line is. And it's also just, again, like my way of coping with my own trauma and, and, and my healing process, you know, just being that vulnerable. It's just like, I'm releasing this and then now I am creating space for, for something new to, um, to, to, you know, replace that. So. Yeah. Renee Brown said in her Ted talk that like, you only listen to people on the TEDx stage who have admitted their failures and their flaws and have that basically that redemption arc. They are standing on that stage because they failed a thousand times and that's what it took to get them there. And that's why we all have these platforms in our own, right. our own stages because we've all failed and been there. So right. I'm with you. Amazing, yeah. I saw that this morning too. Uh, congratulations. And people do like those stories of hope. Um, those are always really good, big posts on, on Facebook, you know, uh, yeah. authentic and honest. But yeah. Um, so when was the last time you wrote on the east coast oh, man. um it's been like over a decade like i i'm i'm trying to get back you know like like really like I, I need to like you know um last time i think was um 2010 yeah so just over a decade um i, I went back for um an afroville um reunion again and that was like a beautiful vibe um, but i haven't been back since like I, I definitely need to go like i haven't been back to see like 
the 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 um the creation of, of like the Africville um you know replica church that's like a museum and whatnot like yeah. Yeah, I was all part of there when that was just a discussion and a dialogue and whatnot. But uh, to see that, um, you know, yeah, I, I definitely need, need to come out back. back. To you got to come out. You got to come out. Yeah, I can't. I'm looking for it right now. I think in Fredericton, New Brunswick, they're having summer salsa. So they're trying to put together oh, okay. you know, their version of like a caravana. Okay. I think it got so, canceled yes. two years due to COVID. I don't know if right. they actually had one in 2019. There's right. that going on. There's also the, in September. Yeah. The Black Canadian Summit is happening this year in Halifax from the 29th to the 31st yeah. of July. But also, yeah. if you're putting that documentary out into the world, the Africville part has to has to have its own little moment in your documentary. Oh, so absolutely. you're you're due. You're coming back. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. I'll try to get you out here sometime yeah. before the end of the year. Yeah, okay. that, like the East Coast is so important to like the Black experience. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it, there's so much history, man. It's it's even it's crazy. Fun fact, um, you know, like Marcus Garvey, he did like a speech out. I believe it was like Cape Breton, and um, you know, you know the Bob Marley line, you know, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our mind. That was taken from um, a speech that Marcus Garvey gave, I think, in like 19 like 36 or something like that, um. And, and that was in Cape Breton. So like his whole idea was for was to get out to Nova Scotia because he heard about like, you know, the blacks out there or whatever, <laughs> but for whatever reasons, um, he, he wasn't able to, to get out there. But it's just like a really, like I said, there's so much like gems in the East Coast, like Marcus Garvey, like this is a very important person for like, you know, like the back to Africa type movements or, you know, like Pan-Africanism, like, like, you know, like all of that, like he's like the super OG in it and, and yo, he gave that like remarkable speech like in Canada. So crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's true. There's Nova Scotia and New Brunswick on unknown a lot too. There's a lot of black history here. Um, this was the first places in Canada where, you know, groups of black people came in the late 1700s, some as free, um, but not really. And then yeah. the other ones as slaves. So yeah, I, mean, I didn't know that either growing up. And my mom's from PEI. I, I didn't have that East Coast knowledge until I moved out here. But uh, yeah, I, it goes yeah deep. I mean, the history is deep. I mean, another fun fact, like a lot of people don't know that, like the first established bank in Jamaica is the Bank of Nova Scotia. You know what I mean? So if you go to Jamaica, you, may, you see the Bank of Nova Scotia, but you're like, oh, why is this here? It's like, well, I mean, if you know about like the, the rum trade, you know what I mean? That's really how like, you know, the banks got established in Jamaica, you know? So, and then we have like Aki and Saltfish, right? Where does the saltfish come from? You know, that's our national dish, right? So there's some really interesting like connections of, the east coast and and whatnot so yeah lots of cool stuff that's why you got to keep doing what you're doing so that we can continue this education because um no offense but the white people aren't giving it just so you're gonna yeah. have to keep it's keep, it's keep mind-blowing like yeah and and to me it's like it, it's so foolish because in one end like we present to the world that we're so like diverse and multicultural like you know when canada day comes like you see the commercials and like all diverse and it's like cute you know what i mean but it's like can we just do this for real can we really be yeah. this? We have all the elements here, but it starts with just being authentic and being like, yo, you know what? We messed up. Yeah, we hid the truth because of, you know, we're racist. Okay, it is what it is. Okay, cool. Let's heal. What can we do to restore integrity to move forward? And I think like most people would be like fine with that. It's like, okay, well, let's just fix this. <laughs> you know, fix it. That's all we want, man. Just fix it. Well, I'll, I'll say briefly, because I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but I was asked to do some some work with Parks Canada about how they could sort of fix the story behind um, the, the Confederation of our country and be more honest about it. And uh, long story short, they were still whitewashing that history. And it was like was so horrifically bad oh. that I, I used the term the fucking caucasity <laughs> because it was rough. It was it was really, oh. really bad. Imagine hearing that a bunch of white men signed Confederation and then were like uh, at a circus, at a carnival after. And we oh. know that that foundation is on the backs of uh, yeah, indigenous sure. black people. Right, right. So people still don't want to own up to their transgressions, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a lot of a lot of work to do. And, um, and, to, and do. to me, like, when, you know, on the flip side, like when when these things happen, it just makes what we do so much more like, you know, like important and, mm -hmm. and meaningful. And, you know, adds like, like purpose to it. Because it's yeah. like, yes, this is why we exist you know because they don't want us to exist so yeah exactly so yeah. anybody listening i would encourage you to follow logic 416 on instagram yeah. and all of the i'll let you list all of your socials to follow but 
Yeah. This episode was super inspirational. Um, I think everybody listening should follow you and all the work that you're doing and keep an eye out. And if you are inspired, uh, also be the mover and shaker in your community doing the same thing. Um, Logic, if people wanted to find yeah. any and all of the <laughs> work that you're doing, because there is so much to follow along with, where would they go? Yeah, um, I, I think like the easiest is like, you know, my, my personal social. So that's um, L-O-G-I-K 416, Logic 416. Um, that's all on all social media platforms. So you can just start there and then that will trickle you into all the other branches of things that I'm connected to. Yeah. Clinton, anything else you want to add? No, I'm good. Uh, Clinton Davis. That's my name on socials. Clinton Easy Davis, Cropberry. We're Black Atlantic on all of our social media accounts, blackatlantic.ca. Logic, thank you so much again for coming yeah. on the show today. So yeah, happy to have one. you. Thank you so much. Really. All right. Peace. Bye, everyone.